Everyone's talking about the metaverse these days, but Workplace from Meta is different. I mean, the clue's in the name, right? Workplace is a business communication tool that uses features like instant messaging and video calls to help people share information. Think Facebook, but for your company. It's part of Meta's vision for the future of work, a future in which your job isn't just something you do, but something you experience. And if you've been listening to this show, you know that experience is something that I am very passionate about and talk about a lot. Workplace from Meta is creating a future in which we'll all feel more present, connected, and productive. You can learn more and start your journey into the future of work at workplace.com forward slash future. Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. The first thing a leader has to do is care about people they work with. And the very best, most valuable feedback you can get is 360 feedback from your subordinates. I become kind of cynical about getting evaluations from your boss because you can impress the bosses or uh, that can be political. But I think in terms of the people you work with every day, they see the good, the bad and the ugly. And I think it's all about caring about your people. People will not respond to your leadership unless they know you care about them, who they are, where they're coming mm. from, what their motivations, why they even want to work there. Tell us about your family. Tell us about your life. Just like you asked me. That's what people really want to know. And today, you know, I think in, in the old days, a lot of people went to work. They did get a job. They wanted to make money. They wanted to get ahead. They were looking for that VP title or that senior VP title. Uh, it wasn't really about doing anything significant or was it about relationships? And today we've realized that's what leadership's all about. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Leading the Future of Work. My guest today, Bill George, the former CEO of Medtronic, senior fellow at the Harvard Business School and author of a new book called True North, Leading Authentically in Today's Workplace, the Emerging Leader Edition. Bill, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, so people don't know, but we've been having a little bit of technical issues. So we're going to repeat a little bit of the stuff that we went over uh, but why don't we quickly go through just some background information about you. Uh, before we had our tech glitch, you were telling me about some ad advice or a conversation you had with your uh, your dad and your mom. So can you share wh what that was? Jacob, I was born in Michigan and grew up in Grand Rapids. I'm the only son of older parents. And uh, my father, I thought was a good consultant. But when I was about nine or 10, he pulled me aside and said, son, I feel like I failed uh, in life and didn't re realize my potential as a leader. And so I want you to be the leader I never became. And uh, well, that's a kind of heavy trip. He even told me, he said, you know, you can be CEO of a company, son. And I held stock in this company, Atlanta, Georgia, called the Coca-Cola Company. And you could be head of that company. And uh, or there's another company in Cincinnati called Procter & Gamble or a new little computer company out in the East Coast called IBM. Well, of course, I didn't know these companies. I drank Coca-Cola. Uh, my mother was the epitome of values. She didn't care whether I got A's or C's. Son, I just want you to be true to your values. And uh, so I, but I subliminally, I rejected my father, but subliminally took in those messages and said, okay, I joined every organization in high school, never got chosen to lead anything, never liked student council, good enough tennis player to play a couple of years of college tennis at Georgia Tech, but uh, wouldn't even co-cap my tennis team. So finding my senior year in high school, threw my hat in the ring to become uh, president of senior class against one other guy. I thought I was a better leader than he was. I lost by a margin of two to one. So you could see that I wasn't. So I went off to Georgia Tech, much as I love the school in part, to get away from myself and start fresh. But being a glutton for punishment, I ran for office six more times and lost all six. So now I'm over wow. seven. And the best thing that ever happened to me some seniors at tech pulled me aside and said, Bill, no one's ever going to want to work with you, much less be led by you, because you're moving so fast to get ahead. You never take time for other people. It's like oh. you're building a resume instead of a life. Boy, that was the best advice I got, ever got. And oh, I put together my own self-help leadership program, leadership development to figure it out and talk to a lot of people, including a lot of those who rejected me and, uh, was able to get it together enough to lead a lot of organizations. While well, I was let's start with the the advice that your dad gave you. Why did he tell you that? Like, what was he having a hard time becoming a leader? It seems like he was a good consultant, but he didn't quite achieve what he wanted. Exactly. 
Yeah, my father was not a leader. He lacked tact. He was very impatient. Uh, could be quite negative at times. He was a good person, wanted the best for me. And I think he was putting all of its energy into his hopes for his son. And, mm. uh, and so, like I say, I, I carried that forward even subliminally all the yeah. way into later in my career. And so, so it seems like the, the feedback that you got was that you were not, and correct me if I'm wrong, like being, being present and focusing on adding, like you were just kind of collecting companies and roles, almost like a Rolodex to try to get ahead. And people were very aware of that and it kind of turned them off. So what exactly were you doing that gave off that impression? Were you just kind of like, Hey, Hey, I want to get promoted. Let me just do this job really quick. Like, is that the impression that people were getting and why? No, I didn't really spend, I just was a uh, go, go, go all the time and really not taking time. I wasn't building deep relationships. Okay. Uh, at that time, they were pretty superficial. And uh, so I, to me, leadership, Jacob is all about relationships. Yeah. And uh, some I've learned over the years and worked very hard on, but it took, uh, I lacked a lot of self-awareness and had a lot of blind spots. And uh, so I went back to a number of the people who rejected me and asked, hey, give me some feedback. So they told me. I was never one of the good old boys. But yeah. uh, on the other hand, I started at that point trying to help other people, mentoring, tutoring, all kinds of things. I could uh, build those and build relationships, long-term relationships and slowing down, not moving so fast. So uh, what, and- what was the feedback that you got when you went out to all those people um, who, who didn't give you those opportunities? What, what did they tell you? You're focused more on yourself than you are on other people. And it's like you want the title rather than uh, uh, than really helping other people. Huh. And they were and, right, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it was a blessing. But why um, why do the relationships matter? Because I know there are a lot of people out there who might be listening or watching this thinking, well, Bill didn't do anything wrong. If he was doing a good job and he was focused on his career, there's no requirement that says in business, you have to build deep relationships some people just want to show up to work, get their paycheck, do a good job. Why can't those people get promoted? Uh, because they're not really leaders. Look, the first thing a leader has to do is care about people they work with. And the very best, most valuable feedback you can get is 360 feedback from your subordinates. I become kind of cynical about getting evaluations from your boss because you can impress the bosses or uh, that can be political. But I think in terms of the people you work with every day, they see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think it's all about caring about your people. People will not respond to your leadership unless they know you care about them, who they are, where they're coming Mm. from, what their motivations, why they even want to work there. Tell us about your family. Tell us about your life, just like you asked me. That's what people really want to know. And today, you know, I think in, in the old days, a lot of people went to work. They did get a job. They wanted to make money. They wanted to get ahead. They were looking for that VP title or that senior VP title. Uh, it wasn't really about doing anything significant or was it about relationships. And today we've realized that's what leadership's all about. Yeah. But there are also a lot of business leaders out there, and I won't name anybody, but I think we, you know, you can probably think of some in your mind who have become very successful leading billion dollar companies but it doesn't seem like they care about people or they care about relationships, yet they're very successful. So what about those people who seemingly got to where they are without caring about people? Well, first of all, it's how we measure success, Jacob. But let's go beyond that. Um, I think that's why I wrote the book, because I think a lot of people in the baby boomer generation, of which I'm a part, uh, honestly, I uh, thought it was all about getting ahead for yourself. It's about your self-interest. The economists even preach this. Today, with the Gen Xers, the Millennials, Gen Z, they aren't going to they aren't going to give you the time of day until you know they know that you care about them and their life and what they want. What are their motivations? And uh, you can't just ask them to be automatons and fit into a nice bureaucracy. Of course, you'll see I hate bureaucracy. But I think it's really changed. And I think we need leaders who understand that. So in my new book, that's what I've been talking a lot about it. Yes, there are a few baby boomers who really understand about people relationships deeply. Mm. And that's how they built their whole careers. 
I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, your first leadership role, was it working for Lytton, Lytton Industries yes. uh, mm-hmm. in, in 1970, which uh, I think you, you said was the company responsible for making the consumer microwave? Yeah. Um, I'm curious to go back to those days. So I wasn't even born yet, not even, not even close to being born at that time. And you, you were a leader there at 27. What was leadership like back then? What was the corporate environment like back then? Of course, we didn't have smartphones. Uh, you know, we didn't have lap, like none of this stuff existed that all of us are using now. Is, is there a big difference in what work and leadership was like in the seventies versus what it's like now? Totally. It's why people work. They thought they worked for a paycheck and uh, to put money you know, away and build a big home. And uh, I think you know, I went to work for Lytton because I met a boss who told me he'd help me become a general manager before I was 30. And I got to be a general manager at 27. And I was kind of a, not an entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur building this. There was no my consumer microwave in business. So I had to start to build it up to a couple hundred million best one of the very best experiences of my life but it was all about people we had a couple hundred people in the so-called commercial restaurant business but we had built up two thousand people and i had to build a team of people twice my age and made twice as much money and uh, did great work (laughs) and to me i that's where i learned how to lead people it was because i was not an expert in the technology and didn't know the appliance business uh you know i had to hire a new cfo could bring in the right kind of financial look to the business, a new quality head, new production head, all those things. Because I was nothing more than the guy that brought people together and saw the vision, saw the strategy, and then got everyone to move forward. Were you given any kind of like formal leadership training at 27 or were you just promoted and somebody said, good luck figuring it out, Bill? The closest thing I had to leadership training was in business school. But in business school, they don't in those days, they didn't teach you anything about leadership. So the answer is no. I had no so, formal lead. It was on the job training and it was in a crisis, you know. And so I decided that, you know, the best training you can get in leadership is put yourself in a crisis. I was packing my bags to go to Minneapolis for the first day on the job at Lytton. And uh, I turned on the radio, we used radios those days, and the announcer came on and said, the Head of the Food and Drug Administration has just declared microwave ovens may be hazardous to your health. Oh, man. <laughs> and great message. So I got up there. It was mass chaos. And I was I worked in the government. I was back in the government trying to get through this pro- problem. So, uh, But that leading in crisis gave me an opportunity, really, to, to bring people together and mm. to learn how to lead uh, in real time. And I've always told younger leaders, uh, Jacob, you really got to put yourself on your really tested. Don't go into somewhere it's nice and smooth. You're a product manager, Procter and Gamble, and you know you're trying to put a different little packaging on Tide or something like that. Get yourself in where it's really tough. That's yeah. where you learn about yourself, and it was tough. I can tell you. Yeah, no, I'm the job training. Uh, did you make some mistakes along the way, and uh, can you share maybe some of your biggest mistakes or failures? Well, the biggest mistake I made two big mistakes. The biggest mistake I made in the microwave business. He yeah, said, so we're doing business with Sears. Our business growing rapidly. They were too. We did private label for them. And we grew so fast that we didn't have the depth of quality control. We lost control out of our quality. And it was in real time. We were trying to keep going. And I kept going and, and probably expanded too fast. But, you know, when, when you're on a rocket ship, it's hard to slow it down. And uh, so I think the mistake there was not getting the rigor of quality in that say when I went to a Medtronic that we had in place or even Honeywell. The second mistake was misjudging the leaders. And this is very important to what I'm telling leaders today. I was looking at the, the reputation. There were two famous leaders leading the company, Roy Ash and Tex Thornton. You know, I got out to the company a few years, not too long later, I figured out they were making the numbers by doing the same kind of things Jack Welch did. You know, taking mm-hmm. reserves here, there. You could take cooking the books. It, it was not in those days illegal, but it was pretty marginal. And then the company, uh, it, those things always run out. It ran out for them. And the other thing, a, a new CEO came in. It was the exact opposite of me, a, a tyrant. And uh, he, uh, he, I remember hearing him tell one of my colleagues who was in the oil exploration business, uh, don't, uh, I know what you had, you had, I know you have to do what you have to do, but don't ever put it in writing because our audit committee is very upset. Well, they were paying bribes and I had set up a very ethical standards. They thought I was too pure. 
but I, I did not have an agreement on what the value should be. I knew what the value wow. should be for our organization, but certainly not for the corporation. So at that point, I knew I eventually had to leave, but I love what I was doing. So it was a real contrast between what corporate wanted and uh, what I was trying to build. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about your time at Medtronic. Uh, so when you were there, um, how many employees did the, companies ha- did the company have? And for people not familiar with uh, Medtronic, what does the company do? Well, our founder, Earl Bakken, invented the pacemaker, and Medtronic makes implantable medical devices and all kinds of medical equipment. It's the largest company in the world. When I went there, we were sub $1 billion in sales, $750 million, and we had about 4,000 employees today. Well, by the time I left, it was uh, 26,000 employees and about $6.5 billion. Now it's uh, 30 and, and $30 billion and 100,000 employees. So it's grown very rapidly, but it's only grown because of innovation and because of the people we brought in. So we had a lot of revamping. We had some great people there. Uh, I didn't have to start over. There are a lot of good people. And we, But as you grow that fast, you got to grow a lot faster. So mm-hmm. to me, leadership has always been about developing leaders who are inspired, can do the job, and really care about the business. And we had to do, we did a lot of that. What were some of your biggest lessons learned as the CEO of Medtronic? Well, number one lesson is it's all about the people. You're the value of the company. And uh, Medtronic went from a billion one market cap to over 60 when I left. Uh, is it, it walks out the door every night. You can have patents, but those are temporary. You can have factories, but it really is all about the caliber of people. When you're growing that fast, how do you get the caliber of leadership at all levels? I've never felt that leadership is just somebody at the top or even a C-suite group. It's people at all levels. And a lot of times you find the people who really matter are ones that have no title at all, but they're the real leaders that everyone looks to, uh, that look to for quality control. They look to for how do you handle a customer? They look to for real inspiration and innovation. So if I want to learn about innovation, I didn't get a meeting with vice president engineering. I went back to the labs and said, what are you working on? And I found, you know, there were certain people that were truly committed to innovation. So you learn who the informal organization is. Uh, Like anyone could create a corporate organization chart. Uh, You can do that in your sleep. But what really counts are who are the people that make the place go? And then what you do is you give them more challenges. You you look to them for uh, greater opportunities. Hmm. Okay, so that's the number one lesson at uh, Medtronic. What what were some of the other uh, lessons learned for you? Well, I learned what counts at Medtronic are the frontline people. I came there, Jacob, I'd had 25, 30 years of high tech experience, but zero in medicine. And so the way I learned it, I went out and uh, got together with doctors, 6.30 in the morning, put on the greens, go into the operating room, watch them do it. But Medtronic had people there that were technical experts helping them. And again, these are not regional vice presidents. These are the frontline sales and service people, that they were the ones that made it go. And what I learned was, what counts in any business are the last three feet. That's between me mm-hmm. and the customer. That's between, you know, or if I'm the customer, that's between me and a flight attendant or someone that's serving at dinner. And I think one of my great concerns about American business the last 40 years, I would say, is we've diminished the role of frontline people. They're the ones that make it go. It was those innovators yeah. in the labs. It was people on the quality line. I had one woman tell me, said, Mr. George, we don't need a quality department. I am the quality department because I, mm. my criteria is this heart valve going to go in my mother or my father. I make a thousand valves a year. If one valve is defective, someone's going to die. And you know, sir, I could never live with that. I could never live with that. So she is kind of the epitome of quality. And that's what you want. You want to honor those frontline people. Uh, they're doing the work. And I think as a society, Jacob, I'm quite concerned that you know, we've only looked at the people and all the incomes flow to the top and we have diminished the income of the actual people doing the work. You know, I've always tried to go the other way but uh, and spread it around. Yeah, yeah. I think you've talked about um, uh, so, some articles that you've written that I read. I think you specifically mentioned GE where a lot of people, either they had the perception that they were these business geniuses or people thought they were, but the reality is all they were doing was cutting costs and letting go of people and doing mass layoffs, but they weren't actually doing anything as far as innovation or growth, focusing on long-term success. They were just chop, 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 chop. 
And, and that's ultimately how they were able to, like you said, um, maybe manipulate or, or adjust the numbers. Let's call it adjust the numbers. And today it seems like we're in a world where you have to be able to put people first. And that's what a lot of, you know, that, that's what makes a great leader. Um, but it sounds like you learned that or you learned that very early on. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of other CEOs at that time did not learn that, uh, but, but you did. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you were at Medtronic and how did you overcome them? Well, the biggest challenge is how do you keep innovation going? Because Medtronic was an innovation machine, but sometimes you hit good parts and then you hit slow part points. You know, you have you make a big investment in a new idea and it doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. work sufficiently. You have to kill the, the venture. And I was a big promoter of the venture. And what I learned is the organization, bigger the bigger an organization gets, the more they want to kill innovation. And it's amazing to me that would happen. That's true of our most innovative organizations. They want to put everything in a process and the, the innovators get die. Or the innovators are mavericks. They don't operate like anyone else. You know, they have labs at home. They're creating ideas. You know, they're, you know, they're doing all kinds of things. And I think if you don't create an environment where innovation flourishes, you know, you're going to be in trouble in a company like Medtronic. So you have to, but you have to have a high tolerance for failure. You have to mm. say, okay, we have 10, 10 irons in the fire. Maybe two or three, one or two of them will be a home run and a couple others, so three or four more will kind of get to first base and the rest will fail. But you have to have accept that. So you have to constantly be thinking about a portfolio of innovation ideas that you can push forward. And that's what I try to do at Medtronic. And I think that's what uh, made the company go. And one of my successors didn't do that and it slowed down. It's easy to milk the business yeah. for four or five years. And yeah. just cut costs. And once you get in that cost cutting mode, you may never get up. Look, I believe in running lean, but I think once, if you believe people are a cost, ultimately your company's going to be in trouble. People are your greatest asset. And, and if you don't believe that, then you probably shouldn't be around the company. What did you do to create that culture of innovation and to let people know that it's okay to fail? Because uh, I feel like a lot of people, even personally, not even from a corporate culture, just individually, we don't like failure. We're scared of it. We don't embrace it. We beat ourselves up. So two-part question there, creating that culture of innovation. And personally, how did you deal with failure when you failed? Well, first of all, we funded uh, innovation very generously. And uh, we put people in charge of the innovations and we gave them a lot of freedom. And if things did fail, we took them out of that job and put them in another one, a giant uh, in real time, just had a, a business that failed and they took the leader out and put him in a bigger business because it wasn't his fault. Now, if he, if he failed because he did a, a sloppy job, the quality was bad, they couldn't produce, you know, that's very different. But if the idea doesn't take off, uh, you don't really punish the leader. And so that's what we had to do. We had to create that culture. And then we honored the innovators, whether you walk down on the floor and you talk to them, we used to have quarterly meetings and we'd bring in people. Now you're going to think this is corny, but you gave them a big patent award and they got, you know, a small check, you know, a few thousand dollars. Uh, but, you know, these people are not motivated by money. They were very honored to be sitting in front of the whole 250 top management in the mm -hmm. company being honored. And we even had a society uh, named after a founder, a black tie society, where people are allocated to the Bakken Society for doing great scientific things. And many of these people never had, held leadership roles. But then they were honored that way, and uh, they were thought of as the thought leaders of the company. And we had a quality problem. Remember, we had a problem with the pacemaker lead, and uh, we couldn't decide what to do. We got the top scientists to come in up to the executive room and, and talk to us, and he was, had no title. He was just a scientist, but he was the person who knew the most. So I always try to listen to the people that had the greatest knowledge. Hmm. And what about failure? Uh, and maybe specifically, you could talk to yourself. Um, did you ever fail while you were at Medtronic? And, and can you share the story around that? And how did you come back from that failure? Well, uh, I was fortunate I didn't fail overall. We had many failures of products that didn't go. Uh, but I, I, can't, I can't honestly say we failed there uh, because the company flourished and did really well. Now, we, like I say, we had some setbacks. We had some quality issues from time to time. Not that it got to the point where it hurt people. We had a new heart valve that we paid $38 million to acquire. 
and spent a lot of money taking the market and it didn't work. And so we had to shut it down and go back and replace the heart bells and all the people had gotten them. There was all, all of 32 people had gotten them. So that was a, that was a business failure. But see, I don't look at that as much of a personal failure. I just looked as part of the risk taking of yeah. the business. And so, uh, so I, I'd like to, I'd be honest with you. Uh, I, I give you a big failure. Yeah. I reorganized the company nine months in promoted, uh, a very capable guy, 15 years older than I was to run Europe. First president of Europe we'd had similar to the job I had at Honeywell. Fantastic leader. Uh, very powerful. Six months after I appointed him, general counsel comes to my office and says, Bill, can I close the door and call our uh, chief auditor up here? And then they presented to me that this guy would run a bribery ring on behalf of Italian doctors. And he, had a, uh, he, had a bri- he was running a bribery, bribery ring? Every time a sale was made, 10% of the sale came to an account oh on behalf of, the, God. of paying bribes. And so I, now let me tell you this story, this, because this is a failure on my part, is that I called him over. He's living in Belgium. And I said, okay, John. I showed him his compliance statement he'd signed. He said, look, the problem with you guys is you're trying to impose American values on us Europeans. And I said, no, John, these are Medtronic values. They're the same all over the world. But I tell you, the easiest thing, Jacob, was to fire him. That was not hard. Yeah. The hard thing was going, I was new, new kid on the block, going back to the executive committee, going to the board of directors and saying, look, the failure is not his. The failure is mine because we didn't check out his values. I promoted him without checking out his values. If I'd done enough, Back checking, I would have found some of these things out. He didn't change, uh, but I misjudged him. And so that was a huge thing. It was very embarrassing, by the way, because we, we filed with the SEC foreign cor- potential Foreign Corrupt Act, Practices Act. Yeah, because we turned ourselves in, they let us off the hook. Uh, you know, everyone in Europe was upset. We employed, sent a new president over. Uh, it was very painful at the time. Yeah. I don't want to trivialize it, uh, yeah, but it was no, clearly sure. a failure on my part. Uh, well, before we talk about values, I kind of just wanted to see if you have any other uh, memorable stories from your time at Medtronic. I mean, that's certainly a very memorable uh, and a pretty pretty interesting story. When you think back at your time as CEO, any other stories, either good or bad, about leadership or challenges, anything come to mind that uh, you think are interesting? Well, you know, Medtronic, I said, was an innovative company. And we had a business that uh, my predecessor decided to defund. It, it was provided a drug pump for kids with cerebral palsy. By the way, Satya Nadella's son, this transformed his life. And he, his son, Zane, just sadly died of cerebral palsy at 26. But uh, this young man, a man named TJ, a kid named TJ Black, he's 18 years old. And we invited him to what we call our holiday party. Every year, it wasn't a party at all. It was all the employees get together and hear from six patients about their stories. And the founder tipped me off, said, look at this young man that's coming in. It's the first one I'd been to. And I was really moved by his story. And he said, you know, Medtronic saved my life. I tried to commit suicide twice. Wow. And now I got my pump and he patted his chest and I patted his, his, his abdomen and, and said, this saved my life. And uh, so it's just me a chill even today. Uh, 13 years later, when I retired or 12 years, I invited him back to, uh, to come and tell his story. And he was now, Hey, he still had cerebral palsy, but he could walk around. He could play wheelchair basketball. He had a wife. He had a child. He had a good job at PNC, the bank, and he had a life. And that story to me, I took that story. I had his picture on my desk and, uh, you haven't even kept it there, but I had it in my desk the whole time because that replicated what we were trying to do. It wasn't about saving a million lives, it was about each one person who we can give a good life to. Mm-hmm. And we all used to say that until a person had a full life again, we hadn't done our job. Just putting a defibrillator in didn't do the job. They had to be active, have a full life. So when I hear people now, oh, my, my son got your diabetes bump. Oh, my father lived because of your defibrillator. I say, yeah, but how's he doing now? And mm-hmm. uh, I think that's the key. Yeah, no, I, I like that story. Um, all right, a- any anything else come to mind or should I jump into the other questions I had for you? Let's jump on to some of the others. Okay, so I was, and, and by the way, if any other stories come to mind, please let me know because I, I mean, the bribery one, that's, <laughs> you don't hear stuff like that often. So, and obviously I don't know what I don't know. So if anything else comes up, <laughs> let me know. Well, um, I'm always happy to tell you stories. So uh, I'll tell yeah. you one more story. I, we skipped over my Honeywell career. And uh, I'm being very honest with you now. 
I was en route to be, you know, I was one of the two leading candidates, probably the leading candidate, be the next CEO of this great global company. Were, and were I you was there when David, when David Cody was there? No, I was, this is long before David Cody. This oh, long, long before. Because I, I had David on the show too. So he was telling Fantastic. me about He did yeah. an amazing job. I can tell you, he transformed. This is the old Minneapolis Honeywell. And I'd gone there part subliminally trans, you know, channeling my father's desire to see me be CEO of a major company, major global company. I'd been president of Honeywell Europe, had a great experience, came back, did a whole series of turnarounds. And, uh, but I, I'm a growth oriented guy. I like to build things. And all we were doing is taking them down, taking them apart. And, uh, there was a, and so, uh, I remember I was driving home one day and like I said, it was one of the two leading candidates to become the next CEO. And on the surface, my wife and I have a great marriage. We have two kids in high school and a lot of friends looked in the mirror and I saw a miserable person, me. Hmm. Now, and I'd been there nine, ten, nine and a half years at that point. Why was I miserable? I was miserable because I was losing sight of my true north. We didn't use the phrase then, but I was grasping so hard to become CEO. That goes all the way back to the, uh, the mistakes I made in college. I, that title of being CEO, that brass ring, I'm sorry, I reached out that brass ring uh, I was striving to get. And uh, I went home and told my wife, you know, I feel miserable. I just feel like I'm not happy. I don't like flying 70, 80% of the time. I know how to turn around business. I know how to lay off a thousand people. That's not, that's not what I want to do. I want to build something. So uh, I went to my men's group and she said to me, Bill, she said, you know, the problem, uh, I've been trying to tell you this for a year. You just refuse to listen. So and then Jacob, the next day, I have a men's group. Now we've been meeting for 45 years, but then about uh, 15 years and told him what I was feeling. He said, well, you turned Medtronic down uh, for a job, I think three times. And he told us that. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, and you're going to hear the eager coming out. I always thought he was going to be head of a major company, not a mid-sized company. He said, why don't you give it a shot? So I thought about it a lot, called the CEO back, got in line. And I remember when I walked into Medtronic for the very first time, I felt like I was coming home. Because here was a group of people with common values, a common purpose, a uh, mission of restoring people to full life and health. And But, you know, if I hadn't had that searing experience at Honeywell, I think I would have made a lot more mistakes at Medtronic. Yeah. This is not against Honeywell. This is about me, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, playing the game. And I, that wasn't who I was. I was even yeah. changing my dress to wear cufflinks, which I've never worn. <laughs> try to impress people so it wasn't yeah. i was inauthentic anything but authentic in those days workplace is a business communication tool from meta think facebook but for your company it's part of meta's vision for the future of work a future in which we'll all feel more present connected and productive start your journey into the future of work at workplace.com forward slash future Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. You gave a speech uh, to Stanford graduate students uh, not that long ago, and you asked them uh, a series of three questions. And I wanted to ask you those questions now uh, because you kind of went through your career. And so I'm really curious to hear looking back on how you would answer these. And the first question you asked all these Stanford graduate students is where are you going to find the passion to lead? Um, so now that you have led uh, several companies, where did you find the passion to lead? See, I'd wanted to be a leader of people, but I never found the right place to do it. I couldn't do it at Lyndon because it was corrupt. At Honeywell, uh, I didn't love the business. I love building an organization. I didn't love the business. I didn't like to go in boiler rooms and things like that. When I got Medtronic, it was very easy to be passionate there. But I've always had the passion to lead people, but I want to do it towards a purpose. Now, if there was a purpose at Lydon Microwave, I never found that at Honeywell because the, the company had a purpose in those days, two words, kind of like GE, making money. That was their purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's not a purpose. And you're never going to inspire the frontline people or the engineers, the, the innovators, people doing the work with that sense of a purpose. So uh, uh, when I went to Medtronic, it was all about the purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, that's what brought people together. We all came together. We think we can help other people. In fact, our metric at Medtronic is interesting, Jacob, because uh, it wasn't earnings per share. It was how many seconds does it take until another person is healed by a Medtronic product? And when I went mm -hmm. there, it was 100 seconds. When I left, it was seven seconds. Today, it's two per second. So you can see mm -hmm. how many more people just do the math 
I mean, more people are helped by Medtronic products today. Uh, and that's what we looked at. And frankly, that's what the people on the front lines measure them. That's what they go home and tell their parents, their families and their friends about. That's what they're proud of. It's not yeah. making 391 a share. They don't say, oh, the company reported 391 against an expectation of 389. That's not what the terms are on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it sounds so like that, you're, you're, your, your passion, it sounds like, came from the what, what the purpose of the business was and aligning that together. And in your yeah. case, saving lives. And that became the passion for you. Whereas if the company said, hey, come work here. We want to make a lot of money. Passion can't, for you, it wouldn't have come from that. No, and I know how to do that. But it's like, you know, are we are we satisfying shareholders? Or are we building a cathedral? And I felt like at Medtronic, we were building a cathedral. Yeah. You know, some you could look back. I look back today. I've been out of there almost 20 years with great pride of what we did. You know, I'm very proud of it. And how these successors have carried that on and made it bigger and better. And mm. so that's the criteria for me. It's not what you do while you're there. It's just it flourish after you left. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, all right, the second question that you asked the Stanford graduate students is around development as a leader. So the question for you is, how did you develop yourself as a leader um, when you were CEO? What did you do? Well, um, I told you I had some early problems with self-awareness. I really had to work on my self-awareness. A couple of things I did, because I tend to move pretty fast and keep a lot of balls in the air. And I, uh, my, my wife called me out on it once and got me to go to a meditation class, Transcendental Meditation. Two hours on a Saturday, two hours on a Sunday. And I said, okay, that's it. No, nope, uh, I've been doing it the rest <laughs> of my life. I'll do it today, uh, 20 minutes a day. And I tell every executive CEO down to first line people, uh, you ought to take time out for reflection. I don't care whether you go for a long walk, you take a jog, you sit in a garden, uh, whatever it is, reflect on and ask yourself the questions. Uh, how did I show up today? Was I excited about what I was doing? Did I help other people? Uh, did I, was I inspired? Was I inspiring? And the second thing I did was really work on getting 360 feedback. We had a 360 feedback I put in at Medtronic, starting with me. So frankly, it was a lot easier to get high ratings from the board of directors than it was from my subordinates. Mm -hmm. And uh, But you get a lot of great insights on confidential written feedback. And, yeah. and so I'm a great believer. In, and I would always start out every uh, review I had with people always saying, well, how am I doing? Even though I was their boss, tell me, how am I doing? What, what could I do better? How can I make you more effective? And I think those two things really helped me develop as a leader uh, yeah. in really listening to other people. And look, there are a lot of times in business, you have to make hard decisions and people don't agree with you, but you, you, I had a policy of anytime we made a decision, we got everyone together who had any, anything to contribute to it and asked everyone in the room to say what they thought by the end of the discussion. And, uh, and then I'd go back and see the people and i say, you know, Jacob, I know you disagree with the decision, but there are some other factors as CEO I have taken into account. What I'm asking you to do is will you support the decision? You yeah. know, even though you disagree with it, you had your, you had chance to express your opinion and I'm asking you to support the decision. Yeah. Uh, and the last question you asked was, uh, um, how are you going to make a difference in the world and what impact um, do you want to make? So for in your case, looking back, what difference do you think you made in the world? What impact do you think you had on the world? I'd like to, this is immodest, but since I was in college, I have been mentoring and helping a lot of people. And I think that's what I hope people remember me for is I help someone when they needed help. I mentor a couple dozen CEOs now, but also just hundred other people. I tell them to call me if you need help. I'm not chasing them, uh, but anytime they're in a different difficult situation, so call that one. You know, you can call and tell me you got a promotion. That's great, but also call when you don't know what to do. I'm thinking about leaving. I have a terrible boss. Somebody at Microsoft called me and said, "I've been mentoring this young man since I coached him in soccer since he was 14." He said, you know, I got a terrible policy bill and he's driving me nuts. He's driving me into the ground. I said, yeah, but you're working for a great company. Stick around and maybe you'll get another opportunity. So he went to work another part of the company. He's flourishing there. And I just think those kind of stories uh, really of what I, that's what I resonate with today. Honestly, today I'm not leading anything, but what I do is I'm helping a lot of other leaders. So I'd like to be, think of myself and my North Star, if you will, 
is trying to help develop other people reach their full potential. And I can be very challenging. I said, you know, Jacob, you could do a lot better if you stepped up in other ways. Uh, But uh, in fact, my new book, we talk about that in the coaching model of challenging people to, to be even better and to make that difference in the world that I asked the Stanford graduate. How are you going to make a difference? How are you going to, what, what do you leave behind? You know, you only got one shot at life on this earth. And yeah. uh, what are you going to, what are you going to leave behind? How are you going to be known years after you leave? I ask CEOs the same question. New CEOs. Okay. You got 10 years CEO. How are you going to be known five, 10 years after you leave? Uh, what kind of person were you? Uh, and I think yeah. that to me is the real criteria. Yeah. It's an important reflective question. Um, well, so I like to use the last few minutes uh, of our show. And I know we started a bit late. Do, do you have another like 10, 15 minutes before we wrap up? I got up? all the time you want. Okay, perfect. So um, for the last 15 minutes of the show, I wanted to focus specifically on, on action items. So you shared a lot of great stories. We talked about a lot of different things. Uh, last 15 minutes, let's talk about what people should actually be doing in their lives and in their careers. And so the first thing that I wanted to go over is finding your true north. Why is that so important and how do you find it? Uh, and does it change over time? We live in an identity society and we're identified by our race, religion, national origin, gender, sexual identity. Uh, that's not what's important. It's who we are inside. And I, that's like judging a book by its cover. I really yeah. want to help people. And your true north is who you are. It's what you believe. What are you passionate about? What do you care about? What's motivating you? Where do you find satisfaction and fulfillment in your life? And so I think you can only understand that by going back and processing your life story and then looking at those difficult times, those crucibles, we call it. I told you about a crucible in high school. I told you another when I left Honeywell. Those are genuine crucibles for me. And I had to go back and really think about what was causing me to do that. And did, was I really following my true north? The answer was no, I was getting away from it. So I think finding your crucible, maybe your parents got divorced. Maybe you got rejected by a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Uh, maybe you went through a divorce. Maybe you got fired from your job. And but so it's in those places where kind of all the pretenses stripped away. I like to say you're standing naked in the sun. You really figure out who you are. And I mm-hmm. think that's in the essence what we all have to do. Because then mm. I think the biggest risk we face is being, is being requiring the adulation of the outside world. You know, when you get caught up in adulation, even the, the greatest inventor, entrepreneur we have today is Elon Musk. But he, in this whole Twitter fiasco, he's very much at risk of being caught up in needing kind of the adulation of the media. Even Jack Welch got caught up in that the last five, 10 years of his career, trying to be manager of the century or something. Those things yeah. don't matter. They pass. That's not what people. Uh, that's not what people remember you for. So it's those crucible moments that tell you who you are, and then you put it together and you say, "This is who I am." You look, Jake. If you may not like me the way I am, but this is who I am. Yeah. And uh, I know I interviewed a lot of diverse people for my new book. One of the people was Beth Ford at uh, Beth at uh, Land Lakes. She's the first openly gay CEO, and she said, "You know, when I go out there, I show up as the CEO." I don't show up as the female CEO when I'm talking to farmers in Iowa, which is my my owners. I don't show up as a female CEO. I don't show up as a gay CEO. I'm the CEO. And by the way, if you've got a problem with that, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah, This is who I am. So I kind of like that being up front, you know? And uh, and so I think that's critical to, uh, to get it together. Does the true north change over time or once you have it, is it, is it yours forever? Like has yours ever changed as, you know, thinking of uh, working at uh, 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 Lytton in the 1970s to being the CEO of Medtronic? Nope. My true north hadn't changed, uh, but I think you can lose sight of it. You know, like I was starting to do at Honeywell. I think you can get off track. A lot yeah. of people get off track. Some of people get so far off track, like a Mark Zuckerberg, they can't get back on. But yeah. a lot of us lose sight of it. We can get back on, you know, and that's why we need a support team around that can help us. We need to have, whether a spouse, significant other, we need to have mentors that can see us getting off track and, uh, or we need to have a support group and our like people that care about us, you know, close friends that say, Hey, where are you going, man? What's going on? Yeah. What do you do when your true North doesn't align with the work that you're doing? Uh, uh, because uh, oftentimes, right. You have this true North and somebody's yeah. saying, Hey, you know, I know this is your true North, but look, 
compromise on it a little bit. It's a high paying job. There's a lot of money to be made. You know, you can still kind of weave your true north in there, you know, be a little bit flexible. Is it worth (laughs) that that compromise? It probably, well, I I don't say just because you don't find alignment, you should leave. I, I think you work hard to find the alignment with the company's purpose and mission. But if you really can't find it, don't compromise, check out. You know, go to another place like I went from Honeywell to, to Medtronic. And again, it, then that Honeywell wasn't a good company is it wasn't the right company for me. You know, and you, you all have to decide where should I be? Where to, you're going to spend more time at work than anything else you do in your life. And uh, don't don't pretty your life away working something just because you're going to make a, a little more money. And when you're doing something you love and you're great at it, you'll make good money, plenty of good money. And you can't take it with you. The only thing you take with you is what you leave behind. Yeah. Uh, what about in terms of values? How do you develop your values? Is it Does it come from upbringing, comes from experience, comes from your surroundings? And how do you make sure that you develop the right values? I mean, for example, we think of Enron, right? Like I'm trying to imagine when the executives at Enron were you know, defrauding lots of people, You know, when they grew up, I can't imagine their parents didn't teach them things like honesty and, and, you know, do the right thing. I doubt that when they were younger, their parents were like, look, you need to defraud as many people as you can and take advantage of everyone and just destroy as many lives as you can. So how do we we get pulled off course sometimes? and, And how do you stick to those values? Most important question you can ask. It's back to that external adulation. And, uh, you know, they were, they were triggered. You know, we have, we forget that before Enron fell, it was, it was in the newspapers every day, this heroic company, all the money they're making, fastest growing company, how much they were worth. And I always tell students, and I believe this myself, and I'll say it to everyone in your podcast, uh, when you're, when you're, when your self worth, when your net worth is your self worth, you're in trouble. In other words, if your self-worth is based on how much money you're worth, if you go home every night and count your bank account, count how much money you're worth, or figure it all out, you're in trouble because that's not what it's all about. And I think the Enron guys got caught up in that and it became a game. It was a big game and they didn't call it defrauding people. They just said, we're, we're creating all these big vehicles where we can make money. Same thing then happened again in 2008 with the bank crash. All those people out, subprime mortgages and giving people houses they couldn't afford and mortgages they couldn't handle. Same game. Then it all collapses. So anytime you play that game, see, the thing is, if you make a little compromise, it becomes a big compromise later. So Mm. look, Medtronic could have made a lot more money in China and Saudi Arabia and India if we'd paid bribes. But that's going to come back. It's going to not only violate your values, it's going to come back to bite you big time. So those little compromises become big compromises. I have a guy talking about my book who is a fantastic leader, a man named Rajat Gupta, who was CEO of McKinsey. First non-American ever elected head of McKinsey, the great consulting firm, elected three times by his peer. And uh, I got to know him after that. And we were sitting on the board of Goldman Sachs. And at the most critical time during the financial collapse, when Warren Buffett was going to put more money into Goldman, no one knew that. And we had just approved the deal. Board meeting ends. He walks over to the window. And he calls a, a well-known inside trader, said, the deal is done. Go ahead and trade. The guy bought $90 million in stock and went to jail. And Raja went to jail. Very sad story. He was a good person. But he, you know, he got on that slippery slope of little compromises, and then became a big compromise. And it cost him his reputation and, it, and, frankly, his respect of all of his peers. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to – you just get tempted – by these things. And yeah. what do you do? I mean, what did you personally do to stay on course and what should people be doing? Um, is it just surrounding yourself by the right people? Like how do you stay away from those types of things? Yeah. We call it staying grounded. And I think it is, first of all, I have a spouse that's always going to call me out if I were at dinner with a lot of prominent people or a cocktail party or something where I'm trying to you know, I used to, don't do it anymore, but I used to go want to meet all the most prominent people in the room when you go to Davos or something like that. Yeah. And she said, you know, you just got to realize, keep your friends from high school and college. Don't abandon them. Remember Jamie Dimon once said when he got fired by Sandy Weil, he said he had to go to Chicago and he said no one wanted to talk to him. His phone stopped ringing. 
the only people that talked to him were his uh, high school and college buddies, you know, because uh, those are the people that count. And I've had this men's group for 45 years. We meet, meet every Wednesday. We'll meet tomorrow morning uh, to 6.15 out here in Colorado. And because uh, we can do it on Zoom now. And uh, and we got a couples group that have been meeting since 1983. These are the people that keep you grounded because people go through difficult times in life. And I find when you, you're out there with the real world, working with people in communities are having a tough time. It keeps you grounded and you don't start to think you're better than you are or think you're better than other people. Maybe you're no. just luckier. Uh, maybe one or two more questions for you. One is on uh, EQ versus IQ. IQ, you know, obviously there's a lot of debate now and we're talking a lot about EQ and the value that it brings to the organization. How can people develop their EQ? You talked about self-awareness earlier, 360 reviews, but there are also other important qualities of emotional intelligence, right? So what are those important qualities and how do you work on them? By the way, I, this is a great question because, uh, and I talk a lot about this in my new book for Emerging Leaders. Uh, we used to think leadership was based on the smartest guy in the room. Uh, there's good news and bad news. The bad news, your IQ doesn't get any better from the ages 10 to 60. It just, uh, you know, you just get a lot more knowledge and a lot more learning. Uh, but EQ can be developed. Qualities like empathy, compassion for other people, uh, having a passion, uh, courage. You don't, you're not born with courage. You have to go out and test yourself, starting a business, uh, Testing yourself in the real world. I'm not just talking about physical courage. Uh, one of the greatest examples of courage is when Ken Frazier walked out of the President Trump's councils after Charlottesville because it violated what he thought it meant to be an American, that all people are mm -hmm. created equal. And he walked out after that. And, uh, you know, I have such admiration for his moral courage. So I think you can develop these qualities over time by putting yourselves in real world situation and learning from them. Sachin Nadella at Microsoft says, we need to have learn-it-alls, not know-it-alls. They had all know-it-alls when he took over eight years ago. And now they're learn-it-alls. And so are you a learner? I'd like to say, anyone you listening, are you constantly learning? Do you learn from every experience? Do you process when things don't go your way? What did I do wrong? Rather than say, oh, those guys treated me badly. No, yeah. maybe you did something wrong. Maybe you caused yourself to get forced out of your job. So look at it. Or you had a business failure. What did I do wrong? What was my role in that? So it's that constant learning and asking yourself and asking other people for feedback, uh, honest, candid feedback. You need truth tellers around you who will tell you what you don't want to hear. And if you ever get so caught yeah. up with a group of sycophants that tell you how great you are, you know you're in trouble. And I suppose the part of this is vulnerability. I mean, that's the topic of the new book that I'm working on that'll come out the mid next year. Uh, but you need to have a little bit of vulnerability, right? To go out in front of your peers, your coworkers, other leaders and say, hey, you know, can you be honest with me and tell me what you think? Exactly. I had a colleague I worked with, I'm still working with John O'Brien, who was a homeless man when he came and he told us about, came to my class and he talked about being a homeless person and he had to learn to be vulnerable rather than she was too cool for school. And I think vulnerability is the key because in, I, for a long time, I had trouble saying, I don't know. Now, today, I can say, I don't know. You asked me something, I, I don't honestly know. And I think having that capacity, or I made a mistake. You asked me how mistakes I made. You have to honestly say, I made a mistake. Uh, yeah. Or I treated, I'm sorry what I said to you. I didn't mean to be hurtful. Uh, but I said the wrong thing, and I'm sorry. So those qualities, if you can say you're sorry, if you can say you made a mistake, you know, or you can say, I don't know. If you can do those three things, uh, that's really, really a shows the quality of being vulnerable. He calls it vulnerability as power. And I got that in my new book because I think vulnerability is power. Because yeah. by the way, like I'm coaching a number of people who are alcoholic and they'll tell you, look, I, I'm alcoholic. I'm, I'm AA and I haven't had a drink in five years, but yeah, I had some real problems. I lost control and they made themselves vulnerable. You know, if you see somebody who's drinking too much and won't acknowledge it, they say, oh no, they're in denial. They won't acknowledge it. It's very hard to deal with them. So yeah. that vulnerability is crucial. Why did you struggle with it early on in your career? Was it just the, the, the culture that you were around didn't support it? Or what, what was it that made it so hard? My desire to get ahead too fast. Uh. Beyond that, when I came out of school, I thought leadership was like a rocket ship. And when you start here at 22, all of a sudden you become CEO. I didn't learn. Mm. The best thing is I do a lot of mountain climbing out here in Colorado. You know, when you get to the top of one peak, you, you, you see another peak to go to. But you got to go down in the valley to come up. And life is like that. You got to go down in some valleys. 
uh, where things didn't go your way to really learn how you can reach your peak leadership. And so I think that is key. And that's being vulnerable. You get down in that valley, that's where it gets stripped away. That's why that's part of your true north, because uh, you get all that pretense stripped away from you. And being mm-hmm. vulnerable is is key, uh, I think. And, and will you accept that their life doesn't always go your way? There's a lot of people out there you have to empathize with. They've got a lot of bad breaks. Yeah. No, I, I like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's very, I think, something practical and actionable for a lot of people that they, they can start to implement. Uh, well, those were all the questions that I had for you. Um, before I ask you where people can go to learn more about you and your book, any last parting words of wisdom or advice for all of the uh, current or aspiring leaders out there? Yes, because <laughs> I think we need, desperately need authentic leaders today. We don't need a group of phonies. We don't need a group of people out for themselves. We need people to know how to bring people together to help them reach their full potential. And I can tell you, if you do that, it's the most rewarding thing you can do. Mm-hmm. That I want to inspire people to go out and lead. You don't have to be CEO. Step up and lead right where you are now. Just be that person that makes a difference. And you yeah. can fulfillment and rewards from that are really, truly great. So that's the one thing I would leave with them. And you can find your true north and you can follow your North Star, which is a purpose of your leadership. And at the end of the day, you'll find you had a very fulfilling life. Uh, And you'll hear from a lot of people how much you helped them. You might even have thought you did, but you were helping people along the way because you only get a real one shot at life. And so I just don't make it worthwhile. I agree. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I love the insights and the stories. Where can people go to learn more about you and your book? Well, I have a website, billgeorge.org, just be, you know, billgeorge.org, easy to find or just Google me. It comes up pretty quick. But I think the book uh, will be is available uh, in, in bookstores on August 30th. You can pre-order it anytime before that. And I hope people will, because uh, I, I really want, I wrote the book, Emerging Leader Edition of True North, to really inspire people, the younger leaders, to step up and lead. We've got a lot of things not so good in this world, but yeah. you can make a difference in the world, whether it's taking on climate change, taking on health care, taking on poverty or income inequality, whatever it is, find your passion and then go do it. And you'll love have a good it. life. I hope people pick up the book as well. Um, thanks again, Bill. Uh, my guest, again, Bill George, former CEO of Medtronic, make sure to grab his new book called True North. Bill, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on the show today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Jacob. Thanks again for tuning in to today's episode. Please remember to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. I cannot express how important those reviews and ratings are to the success of the show, and they keep allowing me to bring back amazing guests. Lastly, don't forget to check out the brand new PDF that I just put out, which looks at the evolution of the employee. In other words, how employees are evolving and changing and what you as an organization should do to adapt. You'll get a complete breakdown of what that evolution looks like, as well as action items that you can and should be taking. That PDF is available at thefutureemployee.com. And if you want to reach out to me for whatever reason, whether it's inviting me to speak, sponsoring the show, or just giving me some feedback, you can always do so. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Again, that's jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you next time.